Good afternoon from New York and uh, Redlands, uh, California, where our composer Sakari Dixon Vanderveer is, Brooklyn, where artistic director of ACO Derek Burbell is, and Hell's Kitchen, New York, where I, Ed Yim, president of ACO, are, am, am. Um, welcome to Connecting ACO Community. Um, the staff and Derek and uh, the ACO board uh, got together fairly soon after this situation started and we wanted to do something constructive and something productive uh, during this time of self-isolation. Um, and we wanted to connect people. We wanted to connect composers with listeners, composers with performers and all of us with each other. And so we started this program um, to do these online premieres once a week. And I think we're on number four now uh, and this week we feature uh, ACO Artistic Director Derek Rommel as on clarinet and Sakari Dixon Vanderveer, one of our beautiful emerging composers who is an alumna of an ACO reading program. Um, before we speak with Sakari and Derek a little bit, I just want to do a little housekeeping. Um, this program is supported by a lead gift for which we're very grateful from Augusta Gross and Leslie Samuels with additional support from the New York City Community Trust COVID-19 Response and Impact Fund. Um, they have done so much to help the arts in New York during this time and we're very grateful. In fact, we're very grateful to all of our supporters at every level. Um, these are uncertain times and uh, you know, planning these mini concerts while working from home and in isolation has been a challenge for uh, our small staff but it's also really invigorated us. And each week we really look forward to spending this time with you, uh, to learn where you're tuning in from, to answer your questions and to share music together. Um, later in this uh, broadcast uh, towards the end, we're gonna throw up in the chat screen a link that you can connect to if you'd like to support this program with whatever you can do during this time. Uh, we realize that a lot of people uh, are uh, worried right now and may not be able to do much and we understand that and we love that you're here anyway. Um, but if you do feel like you can support ACO in this program and in other programs, you can go to our website or you can go to uh, our bit.ly link, give to ACO and we'll throw that link up later. Um, lastly, uh, I wanted to just, for the techies amongst you who are like Zoom Zoom wizards now. Um, if you go to your audio settings, we have enabled you to set for stereo sound, so you can do that. Uh, go to your audio settings, advanced, and set uh, stereo sound. And also, we just wanted to remind everyone that the chat button located somewhere on your screen, depending on what device you're using, is a place where you can uh, talk to each other, um, uh, do virtual applause at any point during the piece, um, or uh, you know, just talk to each other. Say where you're from. We'd love to know where you're where you're tuning in from. And if you have a question that you'd like us to ask Derek and Sakari at the end of the um, at the end of the program today, then use the Q and A button, and we will be monitoring that throughout and getting to some of your questions soon. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Use the Q and A button so we have lots of good stuff to ask Sakari and Derek at the end. And Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Derek and Sakari. Hi guys. Hello. Nice Hi. to see you. Sakari, maybe we'll start with you. Could you just tell us, you know, I, I know it's nice to experience a piece without too much, you know, foreshadowing or telling people what to think or whatever, but why don't you tell us a little bit about the process of writing the piece and like how much were you and Derek in touch and have you ever written a solo clarinet piece before? What is it called? Yeah, so this piece is called Two Thoughts and a Fixation and it's a three movement work. The first two movements are um, a taka and then the, there's a third movement. Um, it was pretty cool getting to meet with Derek over Zoom to talk about the piece and, and different techniques and, and share ideas and whatnot. Um, in my compositional process, I normally like most of the pieces I've written in the last several years have been for specific people. And so I, I really enjoy, you know, getting that input like early on. Um, as far as my process goes, um, often when I start writing a piece and it was the same for this, I will 
you know, maybe do some research for, for inspiration. Um, and then what I'll, what I'll do is I'll just kind of like set that to the side and then go and improvise and come up with ideas and things like that. And um, it's been interesting over the last like year or so I've been, um, the role of improvisation has, um, it's become like more um, central to my compositional process. It's always been there, but um, I think before it was like, okay, I'll improvise a little and then just build off of that. And in my most recent pieces, I've, you know, done like larger, you know, um, stretches of the piece that, you know, are based on that improvisation. And then, then I would go back and sometimes transcribe that or build and develop things. So, um, yeah, that's part of the process there for this piece. So it's too. maybe somewhat more of a co-creation than like a solitary creative act. Yeah, or um, so I, I'll, I'll clarify for this one um, with the improvisation. This is more like improvisation that I did on my own to kind of brainstorm ideas. Yeah, Great. but sometimes I, I will kind of, you know, get ideas from the performers as well, um, hearing little, you know, looks and things like that. So, yeah. Derek, um, when we first approached you about, you know, as the leader of our organization taking part in this program, you were pretty unhesitatingly like, oh, let's ask Sakari if she'll write something for me. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what it was about her music that made you feel so drawn to it? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I just wanted to ask a composer that maybe people hadn't heard from that much yet but they will, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and of course we, you know, Ed, we were, we're trying to, to bring a lot of new work to life and, and um, most of the composers won't be people that, that it won't be folks that they know. So they'll be getting to know new music, uh, new, new faces, new voices. And, uh, and I think it was just that uh, I remember her orchestra piece. Um, you know, I look through all the all the works that go through for all the different programs that we do, including Earshot, which um, which you mentioned. Which is, if the audience doesn't know, it's a, it's a program where ACO uh, does readings in conjunction with other orchestras around the country, where we 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 kind of help other orchestras facilitate those readings and. And so, um, so that this one happened to be with the Buffalo Philharmonic, and I, I just noticed that uh, Sakari's work had a beautiful lyrical kind of flavor. Um, she's a real melodist, I could tell. Uh, and um, and one thing I really liked was I felt that every note she was writing counted. You know mm -hmm. that it was, I could tell she was thinking about all the notes, and uh, not that not that all composers don't think about the notes, but. But I thought there was something special in her melodic voice. And I just remembered that. And then when this opportunity came up, I thought, hey, this is a nice chance to let people hear something more from Sakari. Plus, I wanted to play something of hers. So Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Derek, when someone's writing for clarinet and they're not a clarinetist themselves, um, do you find that there are things about the instrument that, uh, that, that are particularly naughty sometimes for a composer? writing idiosyncratically for a clarinetist at, at, at that point? What, what are tips that you kind of give a composer when you're working with them on the creation of a new piece? Well, depending on how, you know, usually it depends what instrument they're coming from. Um, she's coming from, uh, Sakari's coming as my main competitor, which is the viola. It's exactly the same range as the clarinet. That's interesting. And, yeah, and well, yeah. that's why Brahms transcribed the clarinet sonatas for viola. Uh, he he did it in his own hand. I mean, uh, they they're almost exactly the same range, and they have that same kind of middle of the road feel. Am I a high instrument or am I a low instrument? Sometimes, uh, so it, th that's sometimes a little hard for people to get their head around about whether it's a bass instrument or a treble instrument, but. Uh, I think the toughest thing is look at this thing. I mean, you got so many keys on it. It's just hard to know where the hands go and what they're doing. It's not like a trumpet where you got three, you know, you got three pistons and that's it. Uh, uh, everything's done with the lips. So every instrument has its particular challenge to write for. But I have to say, I didn't have to really 
say much to Sakari. I got the piece and it was really, it was, it was pretty much done. I, I think I gave her some, we talked a little bit about some extended techniques on clarinet. She was very ambitious. And I said, well, I wasn't sure for Zoom, it was the best idea. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, right. She's got a lot of interesting ideas in all kinds of ways. And I thought this piece came out very nicely for clarinet. It reminds me a little of the Stravinsky, well, it's, it's, not, it's not like the Stravinsky three pieces, but it has this three short movement kind of feel. Oh, right. I, I don't know, Sakari, if you, that's one of the, the first solo pieces written for clarinet. And um, my sense is that you know the repertoire very well. So you might have encountered this piece already. I don't know. I think so, like Three Miniatures or something like that, yeah. is it called? Yeah. yeah. Sakari, you said that uh, sometimes when you begin to write a piece, you do a little research. Does that mean like maybe listening to some pieces in the same genre? And if so, um, did you listen to a few solo clarinet pieces be to warm up before you started putting pen to paper or fingers to computer? Yeah, I um, I do like to do a lot of listening in score study too. And um, being in quarantine has been a little tricky because um, normally I'll I'll do you know listening online and and it's nice too that you know there's some like YouTube scrolling scores that are up that kind of helps. Um, but I'll also go to like the LA Public Library and grab a bunch of scores or sometimes local universities, things like that. Um, because it does help to, you know, not only am I hearing the sounds, but I'm seeing how they're notated too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll often listen to pieces with the instrument that I'm writing for, but sometimes I will um, stray from that if I'm looking for inspiration for certain textures or development, things like that. And I, I might go to other works as well, so. Awesome. Derek, we're gonna let you uh, go off to the virtual green room and, and uh, you know, get yourself ready to play the world premiere of Sakari's piece. And when we're ready to have you back, we'll give you like a, a little less than a minute or so, we'll give you a thumbs up and bring you back so that you can play, all right? Great. Bye, Derek. <laughs> Sakari, I wanted to ask you, oops. <laughs> They took me away. Okay. So there we go. Um, Sakari, while Derek's getting ready, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is I always think it's interesting to know um, what's a piece or a recording in any genre that you remember from growing up that had a real effect on you. Um, you know, I remember like the very first recording that I ever bought as a kid, like at Kmart, was um, the movie soundtrack to West Side Story. Nice. And like that just for me, you know, kind of formed my ideas of like, you know, what music could sound like and, you know, it, it just had a big effect on me. Was there anything like that for you? Yeah, I, um, I can think of several things, but the one that comes to mind first is, um, well, just a little backstory. I started composing mainly in middle school and, um, you know, continue that through high school and college, of course. But I remember in high school doing um, a, I did like a research paper for my music class. And I can't remember if I stumbled upon um, his work slightly before or during that research project, but I, I remember learning a lot about um, Arnold Schoenberg and, um, Itanali, and I really fell in love with this piece for quite a Um, especially as a string player, of course. <laughs> and Such I think, for, yeah, yeah. And I think for me, like that moment, you know, even though it was like, okay, you know, here's like music history that was like decades and decades ago. I'm just barely, you know, stem I was barely stumbling upon it at the time. Um, and it was very liberating for me to think like, oh, wow, like I don't have to use a key signature, <laughs> you know? Um, Cause I was just getting a grasp of music theory at that time. And, um, you know, being a string player, I didn't really have the foundation of like, you know, learning about chord progressions and things like that. And I was just starting to barely learn that. And I think the other thing that really impacted me was, you know, reading a lot of his writings as well, because he was a, a teacher as well and um just the idea that like like yeah i can you know use atonality but i can still go and write and see ma major and that's a totally valid thing yeah um, i think the idea has definitely stuck with me as well um 
in my process because sometimes I will, you know, go and explore like crazy harmonies and other times I'm like, you know, I feel like using a triad here and it's totally okay. So I think- And like, now yeah. I feel like that actually in the 21st century, I feel like there's a freedom to use all of those colors and yes. colors, um, without people judging you for it, which I think mm -hmm. is, you know, yeah. yeah. Cool. It's a, it's a great time to be a composer. <laughs> yeah. In that sense, um, yeah. That, 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 that's such a wonderfully beautiful, optimistic thing to say right now, and I totally agree. All right, so let's hear your new piece, uh, Two Thoughts and a Fixation, with, uh, premiered by our artistic director, Derek Bramell, and after he performs it, uh, the three movements, uh, the first two are connected without pause, and then the last movement, after he plays it, we'll have a little virtual applause, and then we'll come back and wrap it up, okay? Okay. Okay, go ahead, Derek.
Yay! <laughs> Bravo, Derek. Thanks. So the, Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so the weird thing about about this current time, right, is like a performance like that, like you can't feel the the audience very much. Um, mm -hmm. But please hope, Derek. I hope you know that Sakari and I are kind of like channeling the people that are watching you and you know really enjoyed that we're getting lots of comments saying bravo and hooray and things like that so yay great all i can hear <clears throat> all i can hear is the dog running around upstairs <laughs> that makes me feel much more like a performer <laughs> excellent excellent um we actually don't have a ton of time left, um, uh, but I, I, we have a few questions that I'm going to ask you. So one is that, Sakari, now that, um, now that we have heard the piece, would you tell us a little bit about the title and, and how that relates to what we just heard, uh, if you can? Yeah, so... Um, often when I title a piece, it's something that comes like later in the compositional process like maybe you know like I've written 80% of the piece or so and um, I usually will I wait to name the piece until I, can, I have this like image or thought or mood that kind of gets um, that kind of sticks essentially and so for me something that's been on my mind and on my radar lately is just the idea of mindfulness and that, that's something I've been to I've been trying to practice more in my own life but um, especially in quarantine, there's plenty of time to <laughs> sit and think about what I'm thinking about, which <laughs> you know <laughs> is is an is an interesting thing. Um, but um, kind of the way that has meshed with the process of writing this piece is um, over the last year or so, I've been experimenting with um, pushing myself to write a little bit. Um, differently in the sense that normally I will, my pieces tend to, um, how do I put it? I tend to come up with a whole lot of iterations of ideas and things like that. And um, I'll work them in, you know, but um, for me, it's an interesting challenge to like make myself stick to an idea and stray like as little as possible while still keeping it interesting. And so, um, yeah, that's been an interest. It's, it's been like a little a challenge for me because as my personality, I tend to once I get um, in a creative mood, I tend to kind of jump and go from one thing to the next very quickly. So, so is, that the, is that the fixation part of the title? Kind of, yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> it just so happens to be like that, yeah. And so, um, and when I get in that mood too, it's like everything else gets like shoved out of the way. <laughs> and so part yeah. of part of that, that third movement or the fixation, if you will, is just like that almost like rabid obsession with a certain thing, so. Super. Yeah. Derek, um, uh, uh, another question for you as a performer that came in is, uh, you know, you're a composer. Actually, Sakari, this is you too. You know, you're, you're both composers and performers. Mm -hmm. And um, Derek, you know, you have organizational responsibilities with us, with ACO, with Copeland House, with the Bowdoin Festival. How do you keep up your clarinet playing chops while you're doing all of that? Like... What's your, do you, do you try to touch the instrument every day? I, I touch it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, it's, you know, I think what, what happens, it's true as a composer too, as you get, and it may be true as an administrator for you, as you get older, you know, you you say, oh, I've seen that, I've done, you know, so you start to streamline, even though you're losing neurons uh, rapidly, uh, you're trying to streamline, you know, your, your thinking becomes very streamlined and you, you, you kind of make associations very quickly. And um, um, one of the things I, I really enjoyed about working on this piece, for instance, is that the first movement has things that come back later in the other movements in the third movement. So it's very harmonically tight. And, and, and that's actually something very gratifying for, for, for a performer. Um, because, uh, you know, I have to wear my performer hat. That's what happens when I start playing something, all of a sudden I become, it's like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing. I become a different person. And I start complaining about the same things that I do as a composer. 
uh, <laughs> but and and I'm sure Sakari, you might have the same experience playing viola. Yeah. So you flip back and forth between these two identities. But I, I really enjoyed that. You know, these little intervals and the way that she changes from this whole tone to half tone interval. It comes back in the last movement, and and then you feel that, and you feel that compactness and the um, and 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 just the sense of economy of uh, material, and that's that's gratifying because then you feel like the performers really thought about every note. Yeah, I mean, and I, you, the composers you, thought about every note. And you mentioned that that was one of the things that attracted you to Sakari's work, so that's that's amazing and. Um, Andre on our chat board was talking about the economy of the first movement too. So your intent, oh. Sakari, comes through so clearly in your work. He's a composer. <laughs> oh, maybe he's probably a composer, yeah. Um, I, I, I wanna just ask one quick, maybe it's not a quick answer, Sakari, but I mm -hmm. was um, reading your website and signed up for your newsletter, which oh, I'm thanks. so excited to hear from you in the future. but. I was so interested to see that you had embarked on a commissioning project for pieces for solo viola from composers over 40. Ah, yeah. And I wanted to know where, how that came about and why composers over 40, what, what were you trying to, trying, was there, is, was there a problem that you were trying to kind of get at? Yeah, that, so that started out of, um, there was an article on New Music Box um, and I think the title was, um, I'm trying to recall, I think it's something about like ageism in composer opportunities or something like that. And um, part of what the article was talking about was um, just the idea that like um, a, a lot of times in, and I see this a lot with um, like applications and whatnot, you know, as composers, you know, we, we do college and we're told to, you know, like apply to everything and all the opportunities and that's, you know, how you'll get seen. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the opportunities are, you know, for people who are currently in college or they stop, you know, if you're over 30 or, or something like that. And so um, as a violist and, and um, someone, I think it was about a year or so after I got out of college, um, I was pretty excited to, um, like kind of, I guess, provide a service opportunity to other composers as well, because I also love performing new music. Awesome. And so um, it was actually, it was a call for scores. Um, and I, I totally did it on a whim. I had like just read the article and I was like, oh, I should do this. And I like put out a blog post, I think within that day or so. And um, yeah, so the, the, the call for scores um, was, you know, for people, I think I set the deadline like maybe within three weeks or so after I did the post. And so part of the reason why I did that very short, you know, time frame was to um, kind of like reach out to people who have already written works and are trying to um, get them heard. Yeah, that sort of thing. And so my offer at the time, because I didn't really like have, I was like, okay, I don't have any recitals planned or anything like that. Um, I was like, okay, I'll record these pieces for you and, and, um, and get them to you at some point. Um, so the three pieces, oh, I'm sorry. That's sorry. fantastic. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the three pieces that I chose, I actually, um, it just so happened that they already did have recordings, but there's still, um, there's still people who are like relatively, um, like unknown, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so I think, um, and to be honest, it's still, it's still kind of a project in progress. And it kind of, for me, it goes back to, you know, balancing the teaching, um, performing, composing. At the time, I was like in a, a full-time job and teaching on the site on top of that. And so yeah. practicing viola, you know, is not always the most consistent thing as much as I'd like. I still, like Derek, you said you touch it every day. <laughs> that's kind of, you know, that's a thing for me too. And so, um, since those pieces already have recordings, my goal is to, you know, put on like a solo concert or something like that for those. Um, and I like, I work with kids a lot and I'm really passionate about teaching kids about composing a new music. And so part of my plans now is to like also, you know, maybe play those pieces for kids and demonstrate them and talk about things like that. So to be honest, it's still, you know, work in progress, putting all that together. Um, yeah. Terrific. 
Perfect. Well, we feel so lucky to have you part of the ACO family. You're a fantastic composer and a great energy and such good spirit. And we're so, you know, we're so happy to have you part of this program. Um, I'm just going to sign off by saying a couple of things, which is that, um, you know, if those of you who have tuned in would like to support this program or other programs like it with ACO, Aiden's going to throw up a link where whatever you can do is greatly appreciated, but we also understand that now may not be a time when you can do that, and we respect that, and we appreciate your being here. Um, I also wanted to mention that next week, um, Connecting ACO Community will feature a world premiere by composer Giti Razaz, <coughs> who was recently, <coughs> sorry, uh, a participant in our reading sessions here in New York, and she is writing a solo violin piece for Jennifer Coe, who's a fantastic violinist um, and a friend of ACO's. And that performance will be dedicated uh, to the memory of C.C. Wasserman, um, who is an absolutely was an absolutely wonderful woman here in New York City who loved new music, loved emerging composers, loved supporting women composers, and unfortunately, <coughs> we lost her on May 1st. And um, so we're gonna do that in memory of Cece, and I think her family's gonna attend. And uh, she would have liked this project, I think, and, um, and all of us in New York who used to run into her at concerts and speak to her about new music and feel her joy and passion in new music, um, we'll miss her very much, but we will talk more about her next week. So that's it for this week's Connecting ACO Community. Derek, do you want to add anything uh, before we sign off? No, thanks, Ed. And um, thank you, Sakari, for the, the beautiful music. And thanks to everybody who's listening. Yeah. Oh, I should, uh, Derek, you, when you have hosted these, you, you've done a great job thanking everyone. And these things would not be possible without um, our supporters, without our community of creators and performers, and without the, uh, we couldn't do it without the ACO staff. Um, everyone's pitching in, uh, Aiden Feldkamp, Jay Jang, Stephanie Polonio, Lindsay Working. Um, it's been a truly team effort and something that's been nice for us to work on together during this time. So Sakari, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Eric, we'll see you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And uh, everyone have a good Sunday evening and uh, stay safe and stay optimistic. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.